Good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning. Uh, welcome good morning. to the Cloud Radio product update webinar. We're here to talk about, I think, maybe the most exciting release we've ever had as a company. Um, we're calling it the M1 release, which I hope will make sense here in a few minutes. Um, for those of you that haven't um, worked with Cloud Radio before, or maybe the first time checking in, um, let me give you just a really quick snapshot of what the Cloud Radio product is all about. Um, basically, Cloud Radio is the product, it's the home where you live with your clients, right? So if you think about your core tools inside your own organization, um, Cloud Radio has become that foundational piece of software that you'll use uh, as an MSP or as an IT uh, service department to work with your clients on a day-to-day -day basis. You're going to live there, your clients are going to live there, and it's where you're going to pull together all the client touch points together into one location of ticketing, training, reporting, planning. It really is a game changer um, in terms of client relationships. Um, I'm Jeff Ferris. I'm the president and CEO of Cloud Radio. Ricky Cicchini is our VP of marketing. And we're here today to talk to you about the M1 release. So, um, so the, uh, the, the major highlights um, uh, are the first and foremost is what we call customizable role-based access which is, is completely transforms the underlying security model of the product, makes it much easier to assign specific roles and tasks within your organization uh, and specific functionality for clients to a degree that's never really been possible or as easy before. Uh, we're adding session logging, uh, content logging, uh, audit trails, all to make it easier to see what's going on in the system. Uh, we've introduced the Mac data agent uh, to collect inventory information from, uh, from workstations. Uh, it's got a, a much fresher UI based on uh, a lot of the Windows uh, UI updates and, and basically keeping with our plan to uh, align the product with the Microsoft uh, visualization. Um, and then again, at, at the end of this, we'll also talk about how we've taken the product and turned it into some different versions. Um, to give you a better sense for um, how uh, you can grow and scale your business uh, effectively with Cloud Radio. So um, I want to talk a little bit about why we call it the M1 release. And, and quite simply, if, if you look back to um, the uh, Apple M1 um, really announcement they made uh, a year or so ago, that basically the, the, with the Apple M1 chip, the day after the release, um, it looked exactly like, um, the Mac looked exactly the same as it did before pretty much, but internally it was very different. And I think with cloud radio, what you're seeing is that internally it's very different as well. It may look similar on the outside, maybe a little fresher on the outside, but internally it's a whole new product, um, and really addresses, um, uh, really addresses that one of the top requested features that we've had over the years to improve the product. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Ricky, who will walk you through the, um, the product and show you why we're so proud and excited about this, this update. For sure. And I may have talked to several of you guys so far. Uh, we made a video about it, too. Um, it's on our support and release article. But I figured we'd just take a look at some of the stuff that we have, and I'll walk you through kind of what it is, uh, how it works with the old versions and all that stuff. Starting with, yeah, let's start with the, the big one, the security logging, we'll kind of work our way back. So you now have a new tab, if you didn't know, right? Under our partner dropdown, you're gonna have the security one denoted by that big old new. And what's happening there is we put the, really the, the brunt of the security stuff in this one. So we've got the user roles, the audit logging, both for the, the individual users and then also the sessions. This is the big one right here, roles. So we've been working on this for a really long time. And the reason for that is that this, like Jeff is saying, M1 style, completely flips up everything we've done before. We've had to completely look at how every single module from something as simple as a knowledge-based article to like routing permissions to everything, how they work in relation to the type of permissions we had. Before they were kind of simplistic, right? Admin, user, something in between. Now they're a lot more scalable. So what you're going to find yourself with is four system default roles. What I've been telling people, and I'm still pretty comfortable with that I've been trying it out, is that these are basically the rough map to what we had before. You've had your, your company reporting one, 
And company reporting is a role that is very, very similar, if not identical to the one that we used to call the admin role. So this would be like your point of contact, which is really just read access to the majority of the, of the product, right? The only thing that a company reporting role would not have access to is the partner dropdown because that's how you manage the entire system. So pretty standard there. Um, we've got the impersonation role. This is another thing that we fixed before, again, kind of a deep cut, we won't go too far into it, but impersonating users, which is kind of a main driver of how you navigate in Cloud Radial, was a little bit iffy because it would show up as if you impersonated them. So it'd say that people came online, when in reality it was you impersonating them. That's kind of done away with now. By using this impersonation role, we have the ability to, again, give you basically full access to every single thing. So when you go into a company, we can both track better and we can give you the right permissions to make sure that there's no funkiness with how all that works. Um, another role that we came up with, right, is owner. This is what we would have previously called the partner admin. The owner is the top tier. This is the one that has full access to absolutely everything, including the partner dropdown. So most of the people that are gonna find themselves in Cloud Radio before should have an owner access, right? And then last but not least is the traditional basic user. We call it something very creative, user. And the user is the same as the user was before. Basically, Cloud Radio's standard operating procedure was to give users the home page, company support and university, and all this other stuff they do not have. I had some questions before of why did you call it company reporting? Why not like admin, for example? Well, the way that we've always rationalized it as well is that Cloud Radio is really, really feature rich, right? We try to stick to a kind of a methodology where we put the more intranet, you know, day-to-day -day Joe Schmo client facing stuff up here. And then everything past that is really related to reporting, right? That's where your policies live. That's where your office reporting lives. Stuff that doesn't quite matter to the day-to-day -day person. So that's why companies reporting. They get all the reporting stuff. So what about all the other ones? What happened there? So again, for the sake of potentially new people watching this, we're not going to dive into a history lesson, but Previously, there was another role, right? The limited admin. So what happened all the time is people said, well, I have a basic user, but they also need to see the dashboards. Or maybe they also need to see the billing part, right? Could you do that before? For sure, but it was a manual process. You had to select that specific person, build their role and call it a day. So if you did that before, you're gonna find yourself with something like this. So there's a custom Jeff Ferris and a custom Ricky Jacquini. What this is, is during this migration from the old version to the new version of Cloud Radial, we basically map over your customized ones and push them over here. So that way it doesn't break anything. And if you dive into it, like I showed you for the other ones, you're gonna see that these are the same permissions that you would have given them uh, manually. So again, we're, we're trying to be very careful about not just like shattering all the processes that you had before. And in the future, what, what's really good about this is again, rather than doing stuff individually, you would come and build a role, right? The UI is, is fairly simple in this sense, in this case, I'm, I'm out of custom roles, I'll just edit this one, it's fine. But you would come in here and you would build the role and works pretty normally, right? Call it whatever you like. You can also choose uh, to put them in user groups based off this role. This is a new feature that should dramatically expedite putting people in the right user groups. That's for content distribution, so a little bit more advanced, but really helpful for those that know. And also really granular permissions on even what tickets they're allowed to see, right? For themselves, for the entire company, uh, do you want them to be able to only see tickets with certain statuses? So a lot of fine tuning. And these are super, super, super important. This is what a lot of people have been asking us for, which is to give us that granular drill down. Uh, most of the, uh, the PSAs have something like this. We kind of took that model. And what you're going to find is, again, you have super, super granular permissions. And if you're wondering what each one does, don't neglect to hover over some of the stuff. We've also worked on our column game. So you can see uh, who's got what, right? And you can choose... The right permission. So again, rather than making one by one permissions, you make the standard set ones. Maybe you want a billing view, maybe you want a different type of admin, whatever you like, and you have those set in stone now. Why that's really cool is again, previously what you had to do is whenever you elected a specific user and you wanted to give them that role, we're going to pick on poor Alan over here. Uh, previously, I had to go into Alan's permissions, right, and, and literally mark him as user admin or something else. That's no longer the case, right? Now you have the predefined roles. So that's gonna dramatically speed it up. Even still, what happens a lot for a lot of people is they come to Cloud Radial and it's a big system, right? There's a lot of permissions. There's a lot of mapping to be done. And generally speaking, I, I speak for most people that they don't wanna do double work, right? Double work in this sense is how do you map 
what users are in cloud radial to what they should be without having to do it manually. The roles take care of a lot of that, right? Now you don't have to do the specific sub roles, but there was still that issue of how do you take them and, and put them in without having to touch every single one? Well, again, we've, we've had a function in the past. This is an existing function, but we've added to it called type mappings. I would advise everyone to, to look into that. It's very helpful. For all of our supported PSAs, what you can do uh, is you can take the types of users in your PSA denoted by either a, a custom field or sometimes literally they have a type map field, like a user type. And you can just tell us what type they are in the PSA and map them over to a custom role in Cloud Radial like that. Previously, what happened was we didn't have the custom user role. So whenever you made a type mapping, you didn't have the, you had the option to either say basic user or full admin. You couldn't map over the billing person in the PSA to the billing person in Cloud Radial. Now you can. Whenever you choose your contact types in the PSA, you can tell us exactly what role they should be, which again, makes it so you're trying to drive as much um, management in action from as few systems as possible. So you're not doing that double work. So that's gonna help a lot of people out tremendously that are trying to speed up their implementation and make sure they control their roles uh, properly, right? So very quick, and I know there's a lot to it, but that's the general gist of roles, obviously. The ramifications of this go pretty deep depending on how you want to set up your product uh, and how you want to set up your roles, but you're free to explore. And again, feel free to take stuff out and delete it, right? You can't delete the, the system default roles, but everything else is kind of fair game for you. Uh, any given role too, I will say, besides just like the high level settings view, you can always get, a, get permissions at a glance and you can also see who's assigned to that role too. So you can take a look at if people have the right access, right? So you may want to take a look at that and make sure that the translation worked out okay. The other stuff that we have in this update, which is pretty cool, is the inclusion of, again, that audit logging both for uh, devices and for sessions for people logging in. So if we go over to the next one over here, sessions, you're going to see that, right? You now have some granular access to see like, hey, me, right? I started off, I did some webinar prep. I got in here a little bit before, I navigated away, right? This is super granular information that we just didn't have before. So now we have it captured, logged, and you can even download it for yourself. So if you're trying to get a proper audit log, you can keep that no problem. So this is about as deep as this goes because again, we're really just tracking who sees what. This is what I was talking about earlier. That impersonated admin role is important because now I can also see that this person did not actually log in. It was actually Seth that impersonated them, right? So there's no mixed you know, problems or confusions about who did what action. We know exactly who did what. We know it, who impersonated them. And again, the audit log tells the truth there. The audit trail to the right of that is a little bit more interesting because this one's really detailed. So this one is the, uh, the, the compliance person's dream because not only are we tracking who did what, but you also have the ability to see and revert those changes. Here's a great example, right? I did some partner feature set updating, right? And you can see that it was me doing that. And in here, I could say, I know exactly what I changed. I know that I went and created a support home menus and I made that myself. And let's say somebody didn't like that at any point, right? Any one of these is going to have the option to revert those changes. So you now have a full audit log with the full actions of the full users and who they belong to and the ability to revert. And you can always look that up at any given point. Now, kind of like our usual methodology, we try to keep the, the bigger stuff back here, right? If you're in the partner dropdown, chances are it's like the global things. You can see all the users' activities, um, all of the, uh, the, the items modified, but this audit trail goes deeper than that too, especially for those out there that manage content a lot, right? Again, maybe you're adding new tickets, maybe you're building new articles. There's a lot of stuff in rotation and those with bigger teams have always had kind of some trouble stepping on each other knowing, did you make that change? Did you not make that change? What's the deal there? Now, whenever you go and create content in your content area, that audit logging thing is still a, a, a new piece of it, right? So if I go into any given thing, let's just do this about us articles, just like we used to, right? You go into a folder and you create whatever type of content you're, you want to, there's an audit log option on every single individual piece. So again, you don't have to scrape that big log. You can literally go in here and take a look and see exactly who did what and how they did it, right? So you can see that a couple of days ago, I went in here and I updated the About Us article and you can even say that I did that and I made some changes to it. So you can always revert those changes. Now, in this case, I didn't really do any changes, but it would actually even tell you the specific stuff I did down to, I changed the letter, I changed the punctuation, it gives you that full log. So this is really cool stuff again for, um, for compliance purposes, make sure that you have the right access and the right people are touching that stuff, but also just to make sure that again, nobody's breaking your stuff and you can bring it back if you need. 
So again, thanks for bearing with us. This has been a long time coming. And again, you can see hopefully why it's taken us so long to do this. Because again, having to map out every single version of this for every single item ever is a big deal. That's kind of what Jeff's talking about. This is just one component of our entire infrastructure change to make sure that all of this stuff is trackable, uh, repeatable, you know, and, and, and revertible. So that's a lot. Um, in terms of the other stuff, changes wise, I don't uh, have a Mac, unfortunately, I can't show you, but the Mac download process is live. It is in preview mode, which is our kind of our beta. And so far, it seems to be holding up pretty well. So what's going to happen is not look too different. Typically speaking, whenever you download a device uh, or an agent onto the computer, it's used for reporting purposes, right? So here's my computer, right? I click on it, and it's going to give you the information. Now, this is a Windows one, right? And you can see a bunch of stuff as far as my agent and my encryption on my drives and all that stuff. Cool. Mac should work pretty much identically. So the Mac information is going to pull very much the same way that this agent does. The process to get that Mac agent, get out there and try it and give us some feedback, welcome to it. Basically identical to how the agent worked before. Um, previously, whenever you wanted to get to the agent, you had to go to your client list. Here's all my companies that I have in here. So these would be your individual companies loaded in the cloud radial. You'd pop on up to the agents tab. And then from here, you would see just one line and just have a, a URL for the Windows agent. Hey, guess what? Right next to that, you've got the Mac install script for each one, right? And that can be pushed out and again, aggregates the data in the same way. Uh, again, that has ramifications, not just for uh, that infrastructure screen, but also for reporting on Macs. Uh, we've talked about this in previous webinars, but the reason that we capture all that infrastructure data other than just pure inventory is to try to help you standardize your policy set, right? Try to figure out from a business perspective what that business needs and make that really easy for the client to, to see. And again, I encourage people that if you're going through and you're downloading the Mac stuff, you know, you may want to build some policies that are exclusive to Mac. And this was a thing before. It was kind of limited to those that have the Adagy integration. Now you obviously can still use Adagy just fine, or you can use the native Mac agent too to bring that information in. So as you build these policies to say, check on, I don't know, if they have an encrypted hard drive or if they have an old uh, CPU, let's say, right? You're going to notice that further down, there is the option to say, hey, what type of device is it, right? Is it a Mac or Windows device? So make use of this stuff, right? Really start to up your game as far as specificity and what you're looking for for those devices, if it matters, and kind of update that. And in general, it's a really good thing. And that's been a long time coming as well. Um, another one that I'd like to mention, and this is a little bit more obvious, is there is a UI change. So it's going to be difficult for new people to spot the difference. I'm sure you can find some old videos, but we really followed the design cues from Microsoft. So Microsoft has generally been our thing. It's not something we shy away from or try to hide. We try to make the product look very Microsoft-ish because it's familiar to users and it just looks professional. So now we've upped the ante a little bit more. We've taken the liberty to pop some of these icons out, round the corners, uh, make the search bar more prominent, make the notifications more prominent so the stuff just looks more appealing. We want you to be proud of your portal as far as looks and how it, how it, how it feels and all that stuff. And I think that the more work we put into this, uh, the better you look and then the better we all are, right? So you're going to notice that theme throughout the whole stuff. Again, these rounded icons follow through, not just to the home page, but also to stuff like the courses, right? The courses now have smaller, more refined iconography. Um, you've got, again, a little bit more of a, a tight view, a little bit better screen sizing. You've got, uh, I showed you a little bit briefly, the, the policies, right, are cleaned up a little bit. So those have also been rounded and, and uh, popped out more, even down to the account planner, right? Even the planner cards have been modified to be a little bit more modern to make the look uh, a lot nicer. And one of the things that's not quite UI related, but it definitely is, is also our themings. So we also had, you know, portal themes. And that was something you could always do. Whenever you go through into Cloud Radial, you could always select the colors that you wanted it, right? And you could flip through and, and, and kind of change them up. Now, that's always been there, but what we've done is specifically, Jeff loves this, and I know most people do, is we've upped our dark theme game because that also looks really good. So I will bust over my teams, which I keep in dark themes like a normal person. And uh, you'll see that even the, the, the cloud radial portal and dark theme looks real good now. Now it looks very much in theme. It pops out and it's, again, more UI updates to make it feel really natural, regardless of how you implement it and deploy it. Let me see, now I'm like running out of things. I'm like, did I hit it all? Did I miss one? Improved UI, Mac data? Yep, I think I'm, I'm pretty close. What about you, Jeff? Any, any 
so, comments so, or anything I missed? So a couple of quick things, just kind of watching the, the threads on the messages. The um, With this release too, we just introduced, uh, a desk, uh, updated the desktop agent to 1.51, which does yeah. fix the uh, issue with the, with the build numbers. So those are correct now with the with the latest uh, data agent. So that that's improved. The desktop agent got updated to 4.1, and when we know that there were some issues with um, logging into the to the current desktop agent, this fixes that, and it also introduces some additional security updates. Because uh, again, we rely on the Chromium package to um, deploy the website into desktop. So this application now has um, those additional uh, security updates in it, plus it has that patch for any issues you've had with potential uh, looping of login because again, with the updated security model. So the um, so that's pretty strong. And then the the data agent, um, the um, the data collection agent, you can use that or you can use Adigy. Uh, both will generate basically the same data, um, and it really be depends on whether or not you need the extra functionality that Adigy provides, because it does a lot more than just bringing in inventory information into um, Cloud Radial. Um, but if you just want inventory information, you don't have to have Adigy to do that uh, anymore. So again, those things just open up more opportunities. And again, it, it really does set the stage for uh, a, a lot of other changes going down um, in the product as we go forward. So um, I think that was, kind of the, um, the the big list. I mean, again, there's there's so much under the scenes. Again, I just can't emphasize um, how proud I am of the of the dev team. Um, again, it wasn't a flawless rollout, but every single button, everything you see on every single page got touched. Um, and that's why it took, it's taken us over a year to like fully go from, from concept to implementation um and now that this is behind us uh we have a very exciting roadmap uh, going forward um let's kind of flip on let's flip back because because we'll save some time for for some q a sure i wanted to, to say end. one last thing for i will flip back but i wanted to point something out that um i think is important and is a big differentiator so i know i've talked about the security roles and the ramifications primarily for uh, end users and company people. Again, your billing person versus your CEO versus the CFO. There's a lot of stuff there, but something else that is game changing for us during this one is that Cloud Radial has always had kind of an all or nothing management um, system, right? So keep in mind that previously, like again, you could always do this, not quite, right? We made it kind of work with that limited admin, you could tick them off, but something you could never do that is a brand net new thing is when you create different versions, it's different versions of um, your own roles, right? You now have granular access to the partner permissions too. So those that have been seeking that take advantage of that. Some people have wanted to, to collaborate and get other people in there, say like an account manager versus a support person, all that, but they never needed to see all of this stuff exactly. Again, now that's granular too. So keep that in mind as you, uh, as you build your permissions out. But yes, that's the last thing I'll sneak in there, but I'll flop back. Yeah, one of the things too, the, the um makes me think we've we had the feature request board and again I, I think the the partner uh, level access uh, restrictions were number four on the list the Mac agent was number five on the list now that these are done we can go address the hot the, 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 uh, the upper the upper ones now um, but there's there's been some there's been such good discussion in that limited partner admin roles that oh, that has really helped us shape this feature um, we've gotten a lot of kudos on, you know, at least the concept of, of what we're doing here. Um, and a lot of that's due to uh, that feedback in that board. And if you were uh, following that feature suggestion, um, you got a, you got a, you got a chance to participate and help shape this feature. Uh, so I can't say enough positive things about that feature request area. Um, we always watch it. We may not always respond to it, um, but we always enjoy the discussion between between our partners um, on how they see a product or how they see a, a feature rollout. And, and we take that and we listen to it and we try to apply it back to the product as we can as we can get it done. So uh, again, lots of good information there on on how that process works. 
Yeah. Um, and I think, I think you hit the nail on the head too, because I've had some questions off of, you know, this whole thing about like, you know, why do number four in the list instead of number one? Again, this rollout specifically was a long time coming. I mean, this product as a whole can't really scale until we get this under control, right? The logging, the security roles, that stuff's kind of fundamental. And again, before we go adding stuff like projects, integrations, or integrations, all these other things, we really have to get all of those roles down so we have a proper infrastructure to, to grow on, right? It was kind of undersized for where we were. So I think we're, like Jeff's saying, now that we have this down, we can do a lot of the stuff people have wanted that's actually going to show up um, for everyone, right? This is a lot of back-end stuff and obviously some front-end, but yeah. We swap back to the, the old PowerPoint. Let's get back to the bit. And yeah, Jeff, go so, ahead and give so, it away. So a couple of things I want to I want to mention. And again, I we wouldn't be here without the support of our partners. And and again, it's not just financial support. Uh, it's also been emotional support um, and and idea support. And and it really strikes me as we've grown from you know to almost 20 people and 20 countries and you know millions of millions of users how how our journey really has mimicked that of every one of our partners you know we started four years ago like all of you did with you know a person and a vision you know we built a SaaS product uh, with other SaaS products um, just like you guys are doing now whether it's with office 365 Sentinel One. Uh, I mean, basically, it, it the things that you deliver to your clients are automated. They're SaaS based, um, and to your clients, they are SaaS product. You know, Cloud Radial's one claim to fame is we're the SaaS product that helps you visualize all of the other SaaS products to your clients and and, and collaborate. Um, but as we go through this journey, we have listened. Um, uh, to uh, to you relentlessly. We've used that to drive uh, product and user training. Um, one of the things, and, and we may want to jump back to this for a second after, in, uh, after this, is, is to talk about what we've really done with implementations. Sure. Uh, Ricky and his team have done an exceptional job of kind of reimagining and rebuilding uh, basically our professional services. Um, and again, just like just like you with your clients, as you go to deploy an Office 365 license, it's not really an option just to walk away and hope that they use it correctly. You've got to monitor it, you've got to train them, you've got to support them. And so we've spent a lot of time at Cloud Radial to enhance that product experience, not just the product itself, but how you learn to implement it and, and deploy it and, and, and make money off of Cloud Radial, right? Again, as we've grown, we've built out the sales and marketing time. Uh, again, we've we've had to deal with hiring our first salesperson. We've had to hire deal with hiring our first marketing person, uh, and, and we've navigated through that. Um, and now, what we've seen and we've enjoyed over the last four years is hyper growth. I mean, I, we have been growing at such a pace, uh, month over month, with new clients, um, new uh, new demands. Um, you know, again, it's really forced us to up our game um, and, and grow. And again, these are all the same challenges that I know so many of you have confronted um, over the last, um, over your growth cycle is how you go from an idea and a vision uh, to achieve that, that, um, that month over month growth that you, you can experience or are experiencing. Um, and, um, you know, again, it, it, I, I want to always be cognizant uh, of the fact that that we are all on the same journey together, right? And we and we desperately need your help and guidance to, to help us improve and get there. With this, um, in keeping with that, uh, we're with this release, we're introducing, uh, we basically are changing things around to, to break the product into three different versions. And so what this is, we've always had one product, kind of a one size fits all model. And then what we found is that, you know, there are features in there that don't really work for the smaller MSPs. There's price points that don't really work for the smaller MSPs. There's features that are missing for the larger clients. And, and basically now, after a few years, we we really do see really strong differences between all three types of, of clients that we've engaged with. Again, you've got the, the, the people just starting out, people just, you know, maybe getting their first PSA, maybe using email, uh, but basically, you know, that, that one person with a vision 
we want to enable that person to drive new revenues, right, from the very day that they start. And so our starter product uh, is designed exactly for that. It's basically the, the, the full product with a few restrictions, um, but it's, it's designed to help MSPs land their first few clients. And what we found is that when that happens, um, really good things happen going forward from that. Um, Cloud Radio, when you show that to clients, when you show the fact that you're an engaged and collaborative MSP, it opens up the revenue doors. And, and so Starter is super essential for those, those MSPs starting out to go deal with that. Um, for, for, and again, for the professional MSPs, which is, the, the, I think, uh, uh, certainly the largest number of clients that we have, um, we have really focused on features, integrations, things that help you streamline and, and, and create not only the ability to land new clients, but also the ability to start streamlining your internal processes. Because again, once you're more than a one-man shop, you've got coordination issues, you've got um, efficiencies key. And if you can put off hiring that account manager, if you can put off hiring that extra service person, that's just money in your pocket. And Cloud Radial is designed to help you achieve those goals to save that money as well as make money with clients. And then when you're an enterprise client, an enterprise MSP, Again, your problems are different still, right? Again, because you do have multiple account managers, you've got multiple locations, you've got, you know, complex compliance requirements. You're working on ISO twenty seven thousand one uh, compliance, and so for that level of MSP, we've really focused on the enterprise. And what you'll see over time is starter and professional will, will always get new features related to anything that's going to help anybody else. What we're doing with enterprise is really focusing on developing a product that meets the needs of larger MSPs. Our goal is not, and again, I, there's a lot of MSP products in the space that call themselves enterprise, but all they do is they, they just put the really cool features in enterprise to justify the price increase. That's not the focus of our enterprise solution. Professional will continue to get the bulk of everything we do. Uh, so again, enterprise isn't a pricing strategy for us. It's a mentality to go develop a, a enterprise solution for enterprise uh, clients. With that, we're working really hard behind the scenes uh, to create an, an enterprise class company, right? And that's up and down the line from service support. Um, um, our customer success team is really focused on, again, maximizing the value of cloud radial to you so you can maximize the value of your services to your clients. Price-wise, introductory, you're not gonna see much changing on getting started with the product. The exciting part is that Starter is gonna start at just $95 a month. So it should be affordable no matter what in the journey, no matter where in the journey you are. Um, professional starts at the same price as 195. There are some different pricing tiers uh, with that. Um, but essentially the entry level to the price is is the same and then enterprise we're we're keeping affordable as well not that that's the biggest challenge for enterprises um, but we really want to make sure the enterprises um, functionality delivers um, and, and reaches the scale and magnitude that we want it to do so um, going forward once we go live with all this stuff existing clients will automatically convert to professional level um, everybody will have enterprise preview until the end of March. If I noticed some, some issues with uh, hitting that 10 uh, role limit that's a function of professional, we'll make sure that gets addressed. Um, but basically everybody should have unlimited roles till the end of, of March so they can play and experiment um, and, and see if they need those more roles. But again, it's all designed if you, you know, for, for the typical organization, you should be able to get done what you need to get done in the professional level. So again, price point, we're, we're super aggressive on price. Uh, we're super aggressive on features and then we're super aggressive on service. So um, again, we're trying to make sure that every MSP can basically build their business on top of cloud radio. Um, and again, Enterprise isn't something that we're just using as a marketing gimmick. It's something that we're building into our DNA uh, to make sure the company supports MSPs of any size on any continent, right? Um, again, enterprise is not, it's not a feature list. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach to the business side. And again, I think we're 
probably the only platform that's truly a scalable multinational platform uh, for this. Um, so again, it doesn't matter whether um, what region of the world you're in, we're gonna help you meet your requirements for data governance and compliance. Um, and we are probably the only um, person in this space too that's really investing solidly in professional services um, to help you get the most out of the product and make sure that you get the value. So rather than just getting your money and sending your own way and wishing you luck, we're gonna be there every step of the way and we're building out that, that implementation team and the account management team to, to help you get there. Um, for those that are interested, um, we've got, um, if you're not already a client, um, you can get a demo um, at uh, cloudradial.com slash demo, uh, or you can uh, sign up for a trial at cloudradial.com slash trial. Again, um, we have always appreciated your feedback uh, and oftentimes very candid feedback. Um, but we've always appreciated that feedback and it's really helped us make the organization and the product much better. And with that, um, we're, we're a little over the, the 30 minute time frame that I was hoping for, but uh, we've got time for a little more for some questions. Safi, is there anything you want to, um, to broach? I pulled up in the 87 chats and I was like, ah, good luck, Safi. I know, there's a lot of stuff going on, yeah. so. Can you see, can you hear me okay? You're a little soft, but I, we can pick you up. What's yeah, up? But you know that, I'm, know that I'm here. Okay, so do we have to, so do you have to give the UDF in AutoCAS a specific name to use it in the type mapping? Yes. Or will it work in a UDF on the contact? No, it has to be type mapping, capital T, capital M, type mapping. And it has to be one word put together. There's an actual article out there. I'm going to flash on screen real quick to get to. I know it's not quite the support hour, but I figure, well, we're here. Why not? Fingers are frozen, by the way. It's 25 degrees in Dallas. Forgive my typos. Yeah, we don't do well in this cold weather. Yeah. Let's see. I want to say it's this one. So for UDF specifically in Autotask, it is this. Yeah, yeah. I, we're in Dallas, and just I got to say something about the temperature too. We're we're not very hardy bunch down here. Oh, so so below yeah. fifty are we're like reptiles. We just stop moving. <laughs> so um, so again, I, you, again, twenty eight for us is probably like minus twenty to a, to a, a person in the northern United States or Canada, but it, it's still painful to us, right? So bear with us while we whine about. Are 28 degrees when I know for some that's like summertime. So, yeah. Um, okay, another question that came up is is added you still needed for the max? And I kind of want you to address the differences and, you know, preferences there. I, I think I could even answer that one. It's the same thing as saying, like, do I need an RMM or will Cloud Radial do it? It's like, if your only purpose is to show endpoints and report on them with policies, Cloud Radial will do it. But if you're actually going to manage the devices, because Cloud Radio won't do that, that's really the biggest differentiator. Again, Adagy is going to do a ton of stuff that Cloud Radio doesn't. It's really just for that, right? It's not really a comparable thing. But again, if you're just, if you have a couple of Macs and you're not quite ready to go to a full arm and management thing, or maybe you do have something to manage them, but you're the, you know, you don't want to spring for another solution, that's kind of where we slot in, I think. Um, and then the other thing, Ricky, and I may have you do this because you've dug into the roles so well, but, sure. you know, how do you set up roles for technicians to be able to impersonate a specific client without having full partner admin access? That's, I think, something we need to work on as far as like a round two, because right now our differentiation was just get them down to the specific function of, of um, being able to get into like the specific tabs. But I think the sub tabs, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, that's something else we need to look at too, of like, if I want them to only be able to impersonate, say, you know, three companies or so, I don't think that's a function we can do just yet, right? No, so the impersonation for is limited. If you have the ability, if a partner or a technician has access to that client's tab, today they can impersonate any user in that client's tab. Um, this model, uh, if you'll notice in the in the roles page, there's already 
we've moved the ticketing, um, some ticketing capability restrictions to the role level. Um, and so that's there. What, we're, what we'll do is we'll add that out in the next release uh, or one of the upcoming releases to roll out the uh, restrictions on impersonations and be able to limit impersonations to uh, specific company types um, uh, or maybe in specific companies. So again, we know that there's an issue uh, with, with an account manager being able to uh, impersonate anybody anywhere. Uh, and again, in a larger enterprise client where you've got potentially five or more account managers, we need to be able to limit that to uh, impersonating just certain clients um, in your territory or under your responsibility. Right. Okay. So this was kind of interesting from Alice. Is, I'm going to probably break up the name, but Alice there, Struthers. Mm -hmm. Do the new roles allow you to create a role that would allow a customer to impersonate their own staff? Like if they have an in-house IT guy. That is that is not something we set up to date, but the the ability is there. As we go, and again, this is one of those things that we've now got a platform to build this feature on. Um, and so again, if you in that impersonation role is the role that we pick up for impersonation. And so it basically by to today's standards, it gives you full access to everything, which is partner level. If we start defining the ability to define which impersonation role you impersonate with, if that makes sense, uh, you'll actually be able to impersonate with a with a with a restricted set of features to meet the needs of what you want to do uh, with working with that co-managed staff. So today, no, but certainly the architecture is designed to accommodate that. Right, and and even I can even visualize what that probably will look like. That will probably be like a checkbox saying. Can this role impersonate? Yes. And if so, what is that impersonation going to look like? So again, round one stuff, but we got plenty of stuff. Again, this is the most important infrastructure thing we've ever done for sure. Now, the other thing too, there's I just noticed the chat coming in. You can, that's this is a fix that got slipstreamed in the last day or so. If you're an owner, you can you can impersonate anyone in your company. Um, yes, that, was that, that was a restriction in the in on Monday. It's not a restriction on Thursday. Yeah, so does that address then Jeff John Carroll's question? Can I allow a user now to view all support tickets instead of just their own, but have them as read only? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that again, that limited admin piece is gone. So that's going to um, really address that. So. So this um, is exactly how you would do it. You can set them to see the company, and then you could change all the permissions to read, just like I have, and that would do the trick. Um, okay, so go into the audit stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of really good feedback. That's, I think this is going to be a really interesting and well-liked feature. Um, explain that it starts like today or starts yesterday as far right. as, as where it captures the data. But will the audit trail show the specific API um, in the future? One of yes. Norb's questions. Yeah, so you'll be able to see you'll be able to see if it came from the job server. You can see that now. If you see if it came from the job server, if it came from a user, and um, you'll be able to see the API that it came from the API. There was an earlier question too about the API. Um, we we have got a lot of work to do on the API. It's out there to solve some very specific problems to help support um, the integration with our CSAP partners uh, or uh, some other. Um, specific use cases. Uh, we do have a plan this year to completely revamp the API. Um, again, that API thread uh, has been really helpful in the feature request um, and helps us define what's there. Again, the API is there to address specific issues today. It's not really an API in the way that most people think about the API, um, but, um, but now we have the bones to go build that on and make sure that, that the API can do what needs to be done, so. Um, and then somebody's asking about when is API access coming? Um, don't, again, the API, the, the API works today. Um, and I think it'll log today. I'm, I have to check to make sure, but if it doesn't, it will in the next week. Um, and, um, so we'll keep pushing forward there. So, 
uh, user sync to Active Directory. Um, that's a real possibility. Um, that's a, that's one of the things that's been on the roadmap um, as a potential. Um, and again, we, we work really well with Active Directory. We work with Active Directory from local directory uh, where that's connected. Um, and, you know, so again, we need to create a sync for the Active Directory level. Um, and that's um, becoming, I think, more of an issue, especially as we work with the larger clients. As you work with larger clients than, that, that have local AD, then we're going to have to address that. So, um, okay, I'm going to oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm no, good at interrupting it. you. That's good. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to end the questions on this note. Um, Ricky, would you go back in? And when they put this feature in, I was like, really? Are you kidding me? Could you go back into Teams and show them how to put the dark theme into Teams again? Oh, and I will be eating crow on, on this because everybody seems to like it. But there's some issues. Some people don't have the three dots. Um, this. Oh, it could be, this could be organization managed because what happens is Cloud Radio should automatically detect your Teams theme. So I check this out. If I go to default, right? Now it's going to be on it. Go to my calendar, pop back to Cloud Radio. What's going to happen is it should absorb the theme based off Teams. So it's going to go automatic light theme. And then when I swap the settings and I go to my dark theme, it should do the same, right? So it just goes automatically like, oh, you're in dark theme. Let me run in dark theme in Teams. The, the one quirk with that is you have to turn that feature on when oh, yeah, you do let me show you partner that. customization. Right. So whenever you go into, I want to say that's under account and branding, there's the ability to... I'll do that slower. And I promise everyone that we yeah, have slow down, other, slow down. Everyone that we have hired for implementation other than me, we their caveat is they have to speak slower than me. So I think we're going to be in a good spot if you don't talk to me. Partner settings, uh, account and branding at the top under setup. And then you're going to go to the branding tab. So this is typically one of the things you would do when you first set it up. But if you've already done it, there's a little tick box here saying, hey, let teams override the theme when, when it's running in there. The other thing too is if you don't see that theme tab, then your theming up there isn't set to user set. If you've gone into right. your theme and you've defined it specifically to match your color set, then you're not going your users won't be able to change to that dark theme and that theme option that Ricky was showing earlier won't be there. Right. So it has to be on user set for any user to set the theme to anything that they want. I did that earlier in the call as well. If you're wondering if I click up there and I can change my theme, this only appears whenever you have a user set. It's to let users pick whatever they want. So I can go dark theme in the portal if I want, but that's only with user set, like Jeff's saying. All right. As you all know, I don't like that dark theme, but it seems to be it seems to be a very popular. You know, I, I love getting flashbangs in the morning. It's great. <laughs> all right, Jeff. I'm going to let you. Yes. So Drea just said. It's a tech thing. <laughs> You're right. For, for those of us that just live on the screens all day long. I live on my screen. I just like you to be this? bright and you sunny. Can, there's, can there's, a thing, there, there's a concept called retina burn, I think. I mean, you know, so this affixes the retina burn, right? So, all right. Well, so Y'all were right. I know you like to hear it. You were right. Y'all were right. So, so I, I meant to bring this up at the beginning, but before I, I drop off, you know, our thoughts and prayers are today with the people in Ukraine who are uh, ongoing, undergoing things that we, we can't imagine. Um, for us as an industry, um, everybody on this call today should be reaching out to their clients to talk about cybersecurity preparedness. It doesn't take a lot of, of mental steps to get to the point where we sanction Russia, Russia retaliates with cyber warfare, and that's going to affect our clients and, and our industry. So everybody should, number one, be on the phone this afternoon with their clients discussing either um, uh, improving their cybersecurity or reviewing their cybersecurity uh, and how, that, how that's going to work in case things happen. Uh, secondly, if for any small business, uh, any business that doesn't have an MSP today, they should be looking for one. And I was recounting the story um, back when I sold my first company to McAfee, 
how McAfee was basically um, just really um, knocking it out of the park because every virus that got released triggered um, more sales. And I really believe that we're about to get to the point with, um, with the cybersecurity world where that proximity, where the business we know that just got hacked is going to be a business down the street, not in another state or another city. So any MSP that, um, again, should be talking to not only existing clients, but should be talking to uh, potential clients about Cybersecurity Day, because this is unfortunately one of those things that can really drive a lot of, a lot of engagements and a lot of, a lot of conversations. So with that, um, I will, will say, I'll sign off. And again, thanks everybody for sticking around. Uh, for bearing with us this last few days as we've uh, made something that should have been simple, really interesting. Um, and I appreciate the feedback and the candor and the, and, um, and, and, and the encouragement, again, uh, uh, both good and bad uh, on uh, things we could do better. So I do appreciate it. I appreciate uh, everyone as, as, uh, for their interest and uh, wish you well. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye.